Wow, just take a look at the look on that guy's face. He is definitely not happy with his superior officers. And somehow, I don't think he can see that. Hey everyone, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with a model showcase video for this 135th scale Panzer Bialdachtungswagen Alpha Gay or as I'm just going to probably refer to it for the duration of the video, the Artillery Spotting Panther Alpha G. The model that you see here is built for my own personal collection, it's not for sale and or purchase. However, like I often mention in these build videos, I frequently take on commission build projects from models ranging between 135th scale and 16th scale. For availability and pricing information, that information would be best by contacting me through the email address listed below, which is info at eastcoastarmory.com. This model here is built mostly out of the box, however, I went ahead and made several upgrades to it with the addition of some aftermarket components, as well as also some scratch build added features. We'll be going over all of these additions as well as reviewing the base starter kit in this video. So stay tuned because there's going to be a bit of info coming right at you. To start this video off, let's go ahead and take a quick walk around this model. And this vehicle here is the Panzer Bild Achtungswagen Panther Alf Gay, which was a very unique version of the Panther that, well, never really materialized into anything. Obviously, this vehicle here is based upon the Panther medium tank, which by 1943 time frame was in full production. The Panther was an excellent design that utilized many new technologies that differentiated itself from the other German tanks that were in production at the time, namely the Panzer III, Panzer IV, and also the Tiger, where those vehicles used all flat plate that was more or less in a vertical type format for its hull construction. The Panther basically lifted an idea from the Russians with the T-34 by angling the plates and using a more angled slope design to achieve better armor protection. The Panther originally would have had a fully revolving turret housing a high velocity 75mm AT unit. The Panther also for armament had two MGs, namely MG34Ts, one in the hull in a ball mount, the second would have been mounted next to the main armament as a coax. Both of these units can be removed if necessary and placed on a mount on the cupola which would be used for self-defense when the vehicle wasn't in combat. The vehicles, of course, would have been propelled by a single HL-230 gasoline engine, which was originally intended for use on the Tiger I when the HL-210s were deemed to be underpowered. These engines were improved by the engineers to have a higher horsepower, which gave the Tiger a little bit more oomph, but this same engine paired with the lighter weight on the Panther really made the Panther a nice performing machine, at least when the unit actually worked. However, outside of its basic tank role, the Panther is one of the interesting subjects because it was one of the few second generation German tanks to really have a lot of different variants based on its platform. For instance, we compare this with the Tiger I, which mostly just stayed as a tank type configuration, unless you count the Birch Tiger or the Sturm Tiger, but both of those are topics for another video for another day. The Panther, in comparison, had several derivatives that entered into series production. One of which is the Burge Panther, where they took the platform and turned it into an armored recovery vehicle. And the second, of course, is the Jagd Panther, which is the same platform, but dedicated as a tank destroyer role. And this is a very interesting spin on the Panther, where it was intended to be used as an artillery fire direction vehicle. Basically, this vehicle would keep up with armored artillery units and would help adjust the fire when they are shelling a certain location. In order to do this, the turret had absolutely no main armament at all. The 75mm was not present on this design. Instead, all of the interior space was used and designed to house the range finding and various optical equipment in order to do this job. For armament, the vehicle did keep the bow mounted MG34T and a turret mounted MG34T was kept as well, but again, these were primarily used just for self defense. The vehicle also still had the self defense mortar that was built into the turret roof. Aside from the optical and range finding equipment, the vehicle was also heavily laden with communication equipment and there are lots of radios inside this vehicle because this vehicle needs to keep in contact with both the artillery units that it's communicating with but also with other units on the ground that are going to be communicating back and forth with this vehicle. However the most interesting and noteworthy 
feature that's found on this vehicle is with the dummy 75 that's mounted on the exterior portion. This was done to confuse anyone who sees this vehicle to what its true purpose is. If anyone sees this in a binocular or in an aerial photograph, they're going to think it's just your average run-of-the-mill Panther, which is already noteworthy in its own right, but to conceal the fact that it's a an artillery directional vehicle, this was a tactic that was utilized. This same tactic, by the way, was not unheard of and was done on a number of occasions during World War II. One more notable example was with the M3 Lee armored recovery vehicle where it had just a tube welded in the 75 millimeter position, again, in order to do a similar job. The vehicle was designed in 1943 by Rheinmetall Borsig and was intended to be used as a retrofit for many Panther Alf D bodies which were coming back for remanufacture. However, in practice it didn't really work out all that well because the demand for Panthers to be kept as tanks outstretched the supply so they didn't really have the necessary hulls lying around to convert for them into vehicles of this format. Apparently 41 or so were converted, but there's no real hard evidence on this. And that is just with the Panther Alf D variant. This vehicle here being one from a Panther Alf G is something that as far as I've been able to research didn't really actually exist and is more or less a paper panzer. Before we go any further with the video, let's go ahead and take a step back to when the model was first started in order to get a good idea on what the base starter kit supplies you with. And here's the model at the start of the project. For the base starter kit, I'll be utilizing this 1990s vintage Dragon Command Panther Alf G. Or, if my German is not too deteriorated, it would be pronounced the Panzerbielwagen 5 Alf G. Okay, so if I don't mention this now, I'll be endlessly berated in the comments section until the end of time about my miss ID on this vehicle type. As I just mentioned, I erroneously stated that this vehicle is a command variant on the Panther, and this is not true and was a mistake. In the walk around portion, I just described what the vehicle's true purpose was and what its intended purpose was for. The reason why I made the mistake on this portion of the video was because for the longest period of time, I thought that that's what this vehicle was for, being a dedicated command tank. It wasn't until after this particular model was built and completed was when I learned the true purpose of what this vehicle was for. So for the rest of the unboxing portion of this video, don't be surprised if I refer to it by the erroneous title that I just mentioned. So with that out of the way, let's go ahead and continue with the video. And this is another one of those vintage kits straight out of the 90s and also straight out of my childhood. This model here was a kit that I always had interest in just because I had no idea what the hell it was. Obviously I knew it was some kind of a panther derivative, but the turret and with the way the main barrel is on it made no sense to me. This model here I picked up off of eBay, I want to say maybe one to two years ago or so. So, you know, as it's customary on these videos, it has a little bit of dust on the surface. And this kit release here was a very interesting one that Dragon added to their roster. This kit was released in the mid 1990s, I wanna say 1996 or so. And at this time, this kit was met with wide open arms and would also with a bit of enthusiasm. This was during a time when Dragon was really becoming the forefront plastic tank model kit company in the industry. Of course, this is in the, you know, the wasteland of the 1990s. To me at the time was still in the process of retiring many of the older kits from the 70s as well as re-releasing or I should say retooling newer versions of their older kits. Italeri was basically doing the same thing, but Dragon was just outperforming them in basically every level with both the quality of the kits themselves with the molds and technology that Dragon had of the period, but also Dragon was experimenting by giving you the modeler things like photo etch and other tidbits along those lines. However, I'm not sure if this particular kit has that because this is that, that uh, transitional period when Dragon was starting to implement those extra effects. But this model here, what made it really unique was it was this spin here on the Panther G. The Panther G, as we all know, was a you know, it's a medium tank. However, this version was the version with the command radio equipment and so on with the dummy barrel on it. Which is actually a very interesting variant that Dragon went ahead and decided to tool up. This is not exactly a common vehicle in most accounts and for Dragon to tool it up it was them showing a little bit of risk and also it was them trying to fill in the gaps that were left by the other model making companies for 
at that time about 30 or something years. So this kit here basically utilizes a lot of the running gear and other components found on many of the other Dragon Panther G kits, which at the time, again, they were just, you know, cranking them out, seemed like almost on a monthly basis. The kit here is, I believe, what I like to refer to it as a second generation Dragon Panther kit. If anyone is a fan of my 135th scale Dragon or just 135th scale model videos, which by the way, again, thank you for that, you'll notice that some of the earlier tooling Dragon kits utilized and borrowed a lot of tooling from Italery. And what Dragon would do is they would use the Italery components for the main chunks, like the upper lower hull, the suspension, things like that. Then Dragon would add their own spin on it by tooling up other components that would transform the vehicle into a different variant. Well, they did that with their Panther, and about, again, a year or two later, they went ahead and redesigned and re-altered the tooling for the Panther kit, which removed a lot of the Italery aspects to it, making the kit more Dragon. This one here is one of those kits. In fact, I also did a video on another interesting variant of the Dragon Panther, which was the Colian, the Flak Panzer. The Flak Panzer Colian, and this one shared the exact same components for the upper hull, the lower hull, and also the running gear. Obviously, the biggest difference is going to be the tooling for the turret and the other radio amenities, but we'll see that once I crack the box open. Starting with the Miles box on graphic design, here we have the Command Panther Alpha G right here in the center portion of the composition. The illustration was done by Vince, where you can see it right over there. And Vince was a very prolific illustrator that Dragon used for a lot of their model kit box arts during the 1990s time frame. I'm not really sure if he's still used by Dragon all that much in the modern era. However, during the 1990s time frame, it wouldn't be uncommon to see his artwork on the Dragon box arts. And his artwork was always really nicely done, and this one here is really no exception. So here we have the vehicle right here in the foreground. The illustration quality is really, really good, which again is, like I stated before, common for Vince. We have the tank commander and some Stauffenberg looking like fellow right there pointing out where to go on the map. It's somewhere in late winter 1944 or early 1945, judging by the trees in the background, also the just the cold weather that everybody is in. The background here have a bunch of disgruntled German soldiers, as I touched upon before in the pre-video bumper, and we also have a couple NAS horns driving by, which is also interesting to point out because Dragon made the NAS horn tank destroyer kit, and well, actually it's another thing that I've done a model showcase video on. I recommend checking that out too. But again, the quality of the illustration on the NAS horn, as well as the soldiers themselves, again, classic Vince, and needless say, nicely done. The remainder of the box art is quite typical for Dragon kits of the era. Here we have the name of the vehicle, which is just shoved there in the corner. Nothing really fancy to point out over there. This is actually part of their Imperial series, as opposed to the 39th to 45, which is basically the bulk of the Dragon kits. But in the 1990s time frame, they did release several kits in the Imperial series line. Many of which, again, I've already touched upon on this channel. On this corner over here, we have a little laser type sticker for quality. Uh, quality control, I presume. This is something that I have seen on a few of the other Dragon kits from this era, and something that you don't really see anymore. Of course, right there in the corner, we have the Lizard logo. And the remainder of the graphic design takes us to the side tab here, where we have a thumbnail of the, of the illustration. Of course, this is kit number 9041. The Imperial series has this type of a typography going, with the red band along with the 35 to four, uh, 39 to 45 green stripe. On this side here, we have another kit that's in the Imperial series lineup. This is a Panzer III of one flavor or another. And then we have some corporate information. Of course, here's the copyright, which is 1996. And as I stated before, that these kits are generally a mid-90s release. Opposite tab, same info. And on this side here, we get to see some sample pictures of a completed kit that is in this box. Quite customary to see on Dragon Kits of this period. 
And finally, a little bit more corporate info. Only this time here, the copyright's 1997. So let that, you know, <laughs> talk, discuss that amongst yourselves. Okay, so cracking open the box, we'll reveal the contents, of course. And here you can see all the parts here. Not this, we'll touch upon that later on, but if anyone knows my videos, you'll probably guess what I'm gonna be referring to with that. So, just like with the Flat Panzer 5 Korean, the kit here is all self-contained in one bag. The quality of the kit, or I should say the quality of the plastic is on par with what Dragon was using of this period. Over the years, Dragon have changed the polystyrene used in their molds. If you've seen some of the other kits from the early 90s, the mid 90s, and into the 2000s, and also recently in the 2010s period, you will actually see a difference with the type of plastic that is used. For a mid 90s kit, this is the type of plastic at hand, which is this dark grayish type coloring. All right, so cracking open the hermetically sealed bag from the mid 1990s. gives us a plethora of other bags to crack open. Starting with this runner over here, you can see that the kit supplies you with a set of sponsons, rear idler wheels, the exhaust manifold, which was a very nice feature that this kit supplied you with during this period. But, of course, I might as well get this out of the way, this being a Dragon Kit and being a Dragon Kit of this era, you guess it, what they're going to be using for the tracks, individual length and length. This is something that I am legendarily known for absolutely hating and crapping on in every one of these videos. So obviously these are not going to be utilized. In their place, I'll be utilizing a pair of single DS pattern of Panther tracks. These are Dragon tracks. I picked them up off of eBay a little while ago, just loose. And these are going to be a perfect, perfect replacement for these units over here. And yes, these are better in basically every single conceivable way. Normally, if you were working on one of these kits and you do not have the luxury of these single piece tracks like I have here, the best bet is to go with a workable option. I have several videos on this channel where I talk about different options for workable tracks. One of which comes to mind was Bronco, but you have Fruly model, model casting, and I think even Ryfield models has a set of workable Panther track. Any of those are going to be monumental in making this model not suck. Just, I'm just gonna come out and say it. Individual licking lane tracks are crap. I don't care what anyone says. Don't use them on your build. If you want your build to come out good, swap them out with either a single piece or a workable track set. And that's all there is for that. Continuing with the unboxing takes this runner over here, which is from the Dragon Panther 2. The Dragon Panther 2, as a side note, is a really cool kit. Came out around the same time as this one over here. And uh, in fact, I really, really want to get to the one that I have in the stash. But the this generation of Panther kits do give you this runner over here. And basically, in typical Dragon format, most of these parts are not going to be utilized and are going to be spare bin inhabitants because you're just going to use primarily like four or five pieces on this runner. But this is definitely from the Panther 2. It says it right over there on the tab. But you can instantly tell from the King Tiger sprockets as well as the King Tiger rear idlers. Again, cool kit. I want to get to mine, but that's for another video, isn't it? The next runner is a runner that's specific to this kit over here because it supplies you with many of the turret components for the command variant. Note it has the front portion here of the turret. It has the puzzle cut lines integrally molded on. They do have their torch cut lines, which you're probably going to see in more light once the model is fully built and painted. But you can also see the faux mantlet detailing present and the faux main armament tube is also present as well. It's a two-piece assembly, which again, not surprising. This is something that's done, you know, still today on the vast majority of kits out there. So, you know, you're going to be dealing with a little bit of bodywork on those sections over there. But again, you know, that's customary for these models. Other components on here are mostly hull components. We have some hatches, the travel locks, some handles here or there. But we also have some other turret parts like the commander's cupola, the AA ring, and what's interesting, I'm going to point out at this point here, an MG42. Generally, for the AA mounts on German World War II tanks, they would utilize the MG34T and there's you know reasons for that that I've touched upon in many other videos. So seeing a 42 located in this section here for this purpose is something that's fairly interesting. The detailing on the 42 looks to be pretty good. 
which is again quite customary for dragon kits of this era and also today for that matter. The next set of runners are the row wheels. Of course this vehicle here has the rubber rimmed pattern of the row wheel, but if anyone is an enterprising individual, it's not hard to swap these out for steel rimmed if the builder so deem fit. For this build, however, I'm just gonna keep the stock ones. The detailing on them is pretty good. They do look like they aged very well, considering that this tooling here dates back to the mid 1990s. And tooling technology has definitely improved since that era, but these wheels here are more than suffice for the job at hand. This was something that was recycled, or I should say on the older generation Panther kits. These parts here were actually from the Italeri Panther, but you can see here on this second gen version, Dragon took those parts and made them more their own, or I should say just redesigned them. But even though they did redesign them, they still have some of that Italeri DNA in them. And it's one of those things that's really hard to point out, but if you ever built the Italeri Panther tanks and you see this one here, you could find some trace of that DNA still present. It's pretty interesting, but other than that, these wheels are perfect and yeah, they're gonna be used without any problems. Next runner down is another recycled rinse, wash, and repeat runner from this time their Yag Panther, which is quite evident from the mantlet here as well as the rear hatch. This supplies you with other needed components like the final drives, that jack block, as well as even the front fenders, which are not molded into the upper hull and gives you a nice little extra bit of detailing. We also have here the Panther G fan grills, which are also nicely detailed. I don't believe there's any photo etch with this one over here. I don't see any at this time, but we'll touch upon that as the unboxing continues. Outside of that though, the details are nicely rendered out. Again, considering the age of the tooling. Deeper takes us to yet another Yag Panther component, which is the main tube. In fact, this tube here should look familiar because I just recently utilized one of these spare parts from the Colian kit on my vintage to me a Yag Panther old tank repair video. And if you haven't seen that video yet, I recommend checking it out. This one here gives you of course the sprockets and the idlers for a Panther as opposed to the Panther 2 runners that had these parts from the King Tiger. We have here some of the grill work. And the fender, the side fender sections are in sections, which again gives you a little bit more accuracy and a little bit more extra detailing. At the very bottom of the box here we have this runner which is for the upper hull and also the turret components. This here is exclusively found on the Gen 2 versions of the Dragon Panther kit. Where if you see it, this is another one of those sections where you can see the Italeri DNA present but you can see where Dragon made the improvements making it a more their own. For instance, on the Italeri kit this whole rear section over here was a separate part because you had some faux engine interior detailing. On the Dragon kit here, they uh, just remove that entirely, sealing it up in the closed state. One might argue that's a step backwards, but regardless, you can see the detailing found here on this rear section. The Tallery also had the fan compartments open to the hull interior, while on this one here, they closed them off, mimicking the ductwork detailing that would be present on the real vehicle. It's pretty implied and simplistic ductwork detailing because if anyone knows a thing or two about the Panther and the King Tiger, if you watch my King Tiger videos, there would be little blades in here that control the airflow. But for this one here, the blades are absent, but you do have some of that geometry present. Of course, once you put the grills on, it basically covers all that up, but it is something I did want to point out. The runner over here for the Panther G turret is also, again, nicely rendered out. We have a lot of nice weld lines and torch cut lines, which like I touched upon before. This was something that Dragon was really harping on during this era, and you can see that also here on the hull as well. Here we have the rear plate. Note the exhaust manifold covers are integrally molded on. In later incarnations of the Dragon kit, these would be separate pieces that you glue on for, again, a little bit better accuracy. But even though these pieces are integrally molded on, you can see that they look pretty good for what they are and, again, should build up without any problems. We have some other strap details and mounting box details that are present on the rear section, again, giving it for some nice detail fidelity. 
Over here we have the Bosch light, which is made out of separate components, which is nice because that means the piece is hollow and that generally yields for some better results, as opposed to when the pieces are molded solid and you have to kind of paint them with a paintbrush. But regardless, this is something that I always personally like on, on these type of models. One other thing I want to mention is that the turret, you'll notice, has no locks on it, and it's just a friction fit that would secure into the section over here. Why they did this? Probably for better accuracy. If you want to build the vehicle with the turret off with full interior detailing, the notches not present is something that you would want to opt for, as opposed to something that has the retention system in place. In the past, I have fabricated my own turret retention systems, but on some other builds, I just left it with the friction fit. We'll see how this pans out as the build chugs along. Coming to the end of the parts takes us to the lower hull and this is something that Dragon really changed from the Gen 1 kits and also from the kits that came after this generation over here. As I've already touched upon several times in this video, the Gen 1 kit was Italery tooling and if anyone has ever built the Italery Panther or even watched my Italery Panther videos, you'll know that the under, or I should say the lower hull here, has some key attributes to it. First, the rear sections were a three-part assembly that get affixed to the lower area. The sponsons are not integrally molded on, it's a separate piece that the builder has to assemble. And the suspension is also molded in separate components that get fitted to their appropriate locations. Well, on the Gen 2 version, Dragon went ahead and revised the lower hull's features. First, they made it a single molding. So, no more three-part assembly on the back where you have to do a little bit of body work. No more separate sponsons that can make the build, the assembly a little bit more complicated. But one thing that's a little odd is that they went ahead and molded the suspension swing arms in. And this is something you generally see not being done. You know, the vast majority of kits out there have these swing arms that are separate molded pieces that you glue into place. And this is for a few reasons. It gives you a little bit extra accuracy and makes the model a little bit more challenging, but not too challenging. And it allows the builder to have the ability of modeling the suspension on off-road terrain if they're building it in a diorama setting or format. By molding the pieces in, they're a bit chunkier. It does make the assembly of the wheels hella easy, so that's one thing it has going for it. But generally, this is something that a lot of modelers tend to turn their, specifically the model elitist, but you know, their opinions mean nothing. They tend to turn their noses up at, which is why Dragon themselves would revise this design for Gen 3, and the swing arms were separate molded pieces. The same type of feature was also seen on their Panzer III kits, as we touched upon in the Stug 3 video that I did from them. The we, the suspension pieces were actually separate, but on the Panzer III Alpha end kit, they were like this, molded solid. So, you know, it just shows you that Dragon was always revising their stuff as time went on. Having said that, this piece here, it's, it assembles really quick and easily. And again, I'm not expecting any problems on account. I've already built one of these Gen 2 Panthers before, so I'm pretty much expecting the same type of results. The underhull here is also nicely detailed. We have some good access panel details with their fasteners in place, and we even have that nice little extra piece of plate found here on the front section. Overall, nice bit of tooling. I like how thick it is. I like how it's robust. It always makes for a good build. So that takes us now to the very last runner, which is the umbrella antenna base, or I should say the umbrella antenna itself. This same runner, was also seen on a previous ECA video, which was the Jagdpanzer command vehicle. And this one here, it's literally the same sprue. The piece is really nicely detailed. I like the way Dragon went ahead and designed the runner to protect the umbrella because it is so very frail and fragile that this thing here just is asking to get broken from just bumping into it. But the pieces do free well and you know, they should build into a nice piece. We'll see if I'll be able to have lightning strike twice and I'll be able to extract this thing, clean it off without any problems, so. And that leads us to the very bottom of the box. So, quite clearly seen here, this kit does not have any photo etch. So, PE is going to be something I'm gonna have to acquire for this model just so I could get the fans covered up. But, you know, I'll be touching upon that later on. Here you get to see the instruction manual. Of course, Dragon marks the unneeded parts in blue. And, you know, this is quite 
customary for these dragon kits, you generally have a lot of spare parts when you're done. Only nowadays you have almost like enough to build a whole other model because they give you that many parts, but you know, that's dragon. The illustrations here appear to be CAD drawings, or really simplistic CAD drawings of the area. You do have some modifications to make to some of the pieces. They are well labeled. And I'm not predicting any sort of surprises with these instructions over here. Occasionally there is a hiccup or two, but generally the one complaint that I have about instructions on newer kits is that there's so much stuff going on that it just looks like an octopus of little arrows and it's really easy to miss something in that type of format. But with this one here, everything seems to be clear and concise and again, I'm not predicting any sort of issues. Ah, one last straggler remains and that is the decal sheet. The markings here are water slide decals and one thing that I've always noticed on these dragon kits is that the decals are excellent, specifically the ones from this era. These markings here should go on without any sort of problems and we'll see how they finish on the vehicle once it gets its coat of VMS varnish and all that good stuff. One thing that I just noticed is that this decal sheet here is actually a recycled piece from their grill, self-propelled artillery vehicle, which is another cool kit I wouldn't mind adding to the collection, but again, another story for another day. As for this little decal sheet here, I'm not seeing any sort of problems with cracking or other type of surface issues, and I'm pretty certain that these things here are gonna go on the model without any problems. But again, we'll see how that pans out. So here's the model ready for painting. Before I go ahead and take it to the painting process and to the completion process, I might as well feature some of the interesting things that I did to this model in order to get it up to this position. Because after this point onward, I could obviously talk about it, but it's not really going to be as informative as if I show it at this point here. So let's go ahead and go over that. The first thing I'm going to mention are the sprockets. Now, of course, this vehicle originally would have the terrible individual Lincoln Lane track, and those were promptly swapped out for a single piece vinyl track from Dragon. Well, in order to secure those in place, one modification that I always make to Dragon kits of this era involves modifying the sprockets. The sprockets themselves time very well, if not perfectly, with the Dragon track, but one thing about the way the kit is designed is that the kit obviously was originally intended for the use of, well, individual Lincoln Link track. And to do that, the sprockets have no provisions on securing to the final drives in a way that allows them still to rotate. With the way this kit is designed, you are solely designed or intended to glue the sprocket permanently to the final drive because then you could attempt magically somehow to get those terrible links in place. For using or should say for modifying the vehicle to use either workable link or just single piece vinyl, you are going to have to make a modification to the sprocket because I always found it's easier to thread the track onto the section over here if the sprocket has some position ability to it. And to do that, the sprockets were modified where there's a metal rod on the inside over here that holds them together, but you can see that I can still pivot them, which is going to come in handy when it comes time for the track installation. If I just go ahead and wiggle these parts off because they are not glued on at this point. Now you get to see what the sprockets look like. So fortunately with the way the kit is designed, the top portion here of the sprocket is actually very, very thick. And because of that, you do have sufficient material to remove via a pin vise and that'll give you enough meat to have a metal rod like this one over here plug into place. Once the unit plugs into place, it really does a good job with supporting it, giving it extra structure to hold it where it needs to be. On the tank itself, the final drive section there, right there in the center, is drilled out along with the inner hull portion needs to be drilled out as well. With the way the kit is, you have to be very careful about this because with the severe angle here of the front plate, if you're off a little bit, it's actually going to drill through this material. And that's obviously something that's less than ideal. On the final drive here, I used a larger hole compared to the hole needed for the wire and also 
compared to the hole that I drilled into the sprocket because this actually aids with alignment and it makes the piece install in a more streamlined manner. But that hole is only on the outside here of the final drive. The hole that needs to be drilled into the wall here of the hull is using the same size bit that I used to drill the one here on the sprocket. And if everything lines up absolutely perfectly, you're not gonna have any sort of collateral damage going through the front plate. It is a fairly risky procedure, but if it's one that you take your time with and you properly index and drill out, you should have no problems with this modification. Of course, the sprockets are not going to be movable for long after the installation because the top portions of the track are going to be glued to the wheels, but that's something you're going to be seeing towards the next portion of the video. The next important modification I wanted to make was with the command equipment that's found right here on the hatch. So the Command Panther and this version of the Artillery Spotting Panther have the same type of equipment where the hatch is in the open position and there's this large telescopic type device in this section over here. And obviously for this to be in this position, the hatch needs to be rendered in the open state. Now on my models, I don't like to have them modeled in the open position with hatch permanently glued in the open area, which is something that is just my personal preference. But also on this model here, there's no interior detailing. So having the hatch left in the open position is really not something that I really have much interest in. Now, unfortunately, you have two, uh, one of two options to display this model, either in the position that we have here or all buttoned up. And if you do it all buttoned up, you really take away the nice little detailing that we have here of the telescope. And this is something that I really wanted to come with some kind of a solution to remedy. So obviously with this dilemma, I need to come up with some sort of a solution. One solution was to get another one of these models where I have one displayed in this position, another one displayed in the other position, but that doesn't really solve any problems because I still have to have one with the hatch modeled in the open position, which is again, something that I hate to do. Even on models with full interior, by the way, you'll notice that I never glue the hatches on so I can you know, display the model in one of two ways. And so again, back to what I was saying before, that is not something that really was really appealing to me. So. The other solution was to, well, come up with a way to have the model in a switchable type state where I can have the option to display the model in one configuration or display the model in the other type of configuration. And true story, oddly enough, the way I came up with this solution was one day I was driving on the freeway to the hobby shop to pick up some accessories and components for the one six scale Tiger build. And it just, boom hit me like a lightning bolt. So there must have been a muse in the car with me because the design that I thought up of while driving is the exact same design that I use for this model over here. And it required almost no other complications that you know generally arise, specifically when you're thinking about something in the abstract. It's not uncommon to have a good idea, but for one reason or another it needs to be tweaked or you just it's just not really practical. For this case over here, that wasn't the case. It actually worked perfectly, which you'll see in a second when I actually show how the conversion is done. And the solution that I came up with was to incorporate magnets. The magnets that I used, I actually have on hand and I use them from time to time on my 116 scale builds when the need be arises. The magnets are procured from amazon.com and the link is listed below in the video description. Here you can see what the magnets look like. These are very powerful, but very small magnets. And for a 116 scale build, they come in handy, but for a 135th scale build, these were instrumental because of the really small surfaces and locations where these things need to fit. The thing that made the procedure really streamlined was the recesses over here found in the commander's cupola. Of course, the Panther has this quite tall cupola compared to the shorter profile ones found on the Tiger one and the King Tiger, specifically the late Tiger one, that is. And with this recess over here, this allowed the perfect location in order to, to secure on the magnets necessary for the conversion work. So to convert the model, what I am going to do is I'm going to remove the turret off of the hull. And if I flip it over, you can see the magnets right here on the interior portion. There are three magnets utilized in total. 
Two are located in the cupola and the other one is found on the optic itself. To convert the model, you basically just yank away on the optic. It just breaks away with no other problems. You can see the one magnet just simply super glued to this flat portion here found on the optic which made the job even that much more easily done. And the other magnet is directly below the hatch pivot section that we have right here. As you can see the hatch is held on with the magnet and doesn't fall out. In order to modify the hatch so it's magnetic I had to do one thing. The hatch originally would have had a plastic stem coming off the bottom portion. The stem it's you know, decent on these Dragon Malls. It does secure the hatch very nicely in the cupola itself. However the stem itself is on the shorter side. It's really meant to be displayed in, in either or condi condition and it's not something that you can make convertible. So what I did was I went ahead and snipped off the original kit supplied stem, drilled out this section over here with a pin vise and I secured on a metal wire. The wire of course needed to have some kind of iron content in it or be some kind of a steel alloy so that it's ferrous so that obviously is going to attract to the magnet. The magnet was positioned directly below this little hinge section over here and it did require just a small little cutout found right there on the bottom portion of the cupola. This was done with a Dremel with a router bit and then the piece was dropped directly into place. So with this piece being removable now I go ahead and just simply drop the hatch where it needs to be in the closed state and you can see that it holds it in place absolutely perfectly. And with that small little handle on it over there, I can go ahead and just open it up to the way we see it right here. Again, holds it in very nicely. So that's all there is for the conversion work. However, the last thing, I, or I should say the next thing I want to talk about is with the optic itself. So you're going to say, John, that's great that you can make the piece come apart, but what about this? This is running around loose, you know, that could cause problems, you can lose it, and you know, it could lead to a multitude of other issues. Well, that's where the hull comes in. Because, you know, you could store it in the hull. There's nothing in there that, you know, it's not like it's an interior model kit. And so I could just store it on the inside. But that does have some complications to it because you can say, yeah, but you know, the piece is going to rattle on the inside and it's going to be kind of chintzy. And also can potentially cause damage to the part itself where it gets scratched or, you know, other things can happen. You're absolutely correct, which is why I decided to make a mounting point like a holster found on the inside. The way this is done is again with the use of magnets. On the inside here you'll see a small little sheet metal plate glued to the bottom of the hull and this is used to lock the piece in place. So when I'm trying to display the model or store the model in the closed condition I take the optic over here, drop it on, and as you can see it holds it in place absolutely firmly and there's no rattle or anything else along those lines. I just pop the turret back on the model and presto the model's now able to be displayed in the buttoned up state. Starting with the model's running gear, all of the components that you see here with the exception of the track are kit supplied and went on in the kit manner. There are absolutely no changes or other sorts of hand fitting that needs to have been done in order to get these components fitted in place and everything was a problem free install. One other thing I want to mention is that although the kit's tooling dates back to the 1990s, you can see that the row wheels over here aged very, very well, and the detailing on the surface that's molded in is excellent. They painted and weathered without any sort of problems. And of course, being an ECA video, I have to do the obligatory mention about the red Zerk fittings that are found on the center portions here, are all the hubcaps. This detailing is molded in, and in order to just spice the model up, a little brush of red paint was all that was utilized. Once the red paint was added, it's always a really easy way to enhance your build. On the remainder of the weathering, you can see that I went with my usual format with the row wheel bearings having the sweaty and sometimes dripping look which is very commonly seen on these type of vehicles. These bearings wore out very quickly or I should say the seals wore out very quickly and it wouldn't be uncommon to see the type of weathering effects that are present on this build. 
Also on that note, as I often mention, when you're doing this type of a weathering technique, you don't want to use the exact same technique in the same spots on the same wheel sections because this will actually have a detrimental effect instead of helping the model. You want to go as random with it as possible and you can see that with this build over here where some wheels, the seals are not drippy at all, some of them are sweaty and others have a drip or two and others have even more drips. Everything is random and this is the best way to ensure that your model has a little bit of extra character and also gives it a nice little unique bit of detailing. The next thing to mention on the lower area is of course the track. The track on this model is not the kit original ones for the reasons that I mentioned before but in a nutshell I replaced them with a set of single piece DS styrene tracks that I acquired second hand on eBay. The DS tracks are far superior compared to the original Lincoln Links and obviously it was a really smart choice. The tracks paint very nicely, weather nicely, and one thing I like about the DS tracks is that they set extremely well to the suspension. Just a small drops of glue on some of the row wheels was all that was required in order to get the tracks in the configuration that we have here. And this is a really easy way to enhance the look of this build. In fact, I'll go ahead and say that it is a mandatory bit of equipment for you to build this old school model. The individual Lincoln Lane tracks deserve to be in the trash bin. They got a merciful ending being pitched into the spare parts box. However, they were a mistake back then, they were a mistake now, and it's always best to replace them with either a single piece or a workable track link option. As I mentioned before, these were procured off of eBay, and from time to time I have seen the DS tracks pop up, and if you have the opportunity to get one, I recommend picking them up. They're not that expensive when found, and they are always a great way to enhance an old build like this one here. The other thing that's cool about the DS styrene tracks is that they time perfectly with the sprockets on these older generation Dragon models, which is something that's really good because there's nothing worse about having tracks that don't time well on sprockets, and for these ones here, it's a match made in heaven. One last thing I want to mention about the tracks is that if anyone out there is watching this and have one of the newer generation of Dragon kits that supply you with the single piece vinyl tracks and are wondering if whether, whether or not you should change them for a workable or an aftermarket source, this is something that I don't really recommend. The stock tracks are excellent in the single piece format, of course, and the only reason why you would want to go with the extra cost and complexity of an aftermarket replacement is if you're trying to do something special with the model. If you're building the model in diorama format and you're depicting it with the tracks either broken off for a repair scene or a knocked out type setting, then the workable tracks might be something to look into. Another reason why you would want to go with the workable tracks is if you're depicting the model in a articulated suspension type setting and the workable tracks will be a better fit for that type of an application. But if you're just building the model like this one over here where it's just in the standard configuration type format, then the addition of the workable tracks isn't really something that's all that worth it in my opinion. And it is definitely something to consider if you have one of those models. And with shilling for tracks out of the way, this leads us to the rear hull details. And basically, everything back here is stock with the model. The only thing that I want to mention is with the exhaust manifolds, as I touched upon before, they are a multi-piece assembly, and there are some seams to contend with. Once the seams are all polished away, at least for a very nice appearance like you see here. The only thing that was really added to the exhaust outside of the seam removal were the addition of the fasteners found in these four sections on the top portions of the manifolds. And as you can see, they really do enhance the look of this component overall. The next thing I want to mention involves the rear convoy light right over here. And as I often mention in these videos, the convoy lights that are supplied with these models are generally ignored and are left unpainted by a large number of individuals out there who build these models. The detailing is present in the molding. The only thing the builder needs to do is simply paint them in order to enhance it further. The square cutouts found on the convoy lights are green on these German World War II vehicles. And so with a little swipe of testers green paint was all that was used in order to bring it up to the condition that we have here. There's also a little reflector found in this section over here. However, that detailing is not found on the Dragon kit. The bracket is there, but the actual reflector detailing is not molded on. So it's okay to leave that part not painted in red as it looks like it probably just broke off at some point in time. However, if the detailing is here, like with the convoy light, just simply paint it and it'll, your build will definitely look nicer because of that. 
On the frontal armor area, there's nothing really too much to talk about except for the MG ball. This was the kit supplied unit, but I added a little bit of extra cast texturing in order to improve it compared to the stock original format. Once the cast texturing is added and once it's fully painted, you really get to see exactly how much it improves the front portion of this build compared to leaving it stock. Also, the bow MG was utilized. The Muzzle end was drilled out with a pin vise and a small Dremel bit. As I often mention, this is a technique that must be done if the builder has the correct size tooling for this and also the experience, not to mention a nice steady hand doesn't hurt. If you do not have any of these type of traits, then this is definitely a topic or I should say a procedure to avoid because you'll end up hurting and damaging the MG barrel as opposed to helping it. If, however, for one reason or another, you either screw up the barrel or you just don't like the kit barrel, there are lots of aftermarket options available. There are some made out of CNC brass that are excellent, and those will easily be able to enhance this build if the builder seems fit. Carry on takes to the side hull details. Obviously, nothing really much to talk about here. It's all standard Panther, and all these components went on as per the kit. They were nicely detailed, and the pieces just went to their correct corresponding locations without any sort of work, outside of, of course, properly painting everything to the configuration that you see here. On the opposite side, same thing is also true. And the one thing I do want to mention, and this is true for all these Panther and Yag Panther based vehicles, is with the stave storage tube that we have over here. This is a two-part assembly as it is on most builds, so there is a seam to contend with. It's easily polished away and once done, it really enhances the build overall. Moving to the tail section of the superstructure brings us to the spare track links. This is the original kit supply links. They are individual links, of course, and I simply just assembled small sections of them for use on these spare track racks. The Individual links, even though I utterly disdain and hate them with every fiber in my body for the use on the main track bands themselves, for spare track links over here, they work pretty well, and they were simply just assembled and mounted to the correct corresponding locations. Of course, when you are building these, you want to be careful to thoroughly deburr all the little stems of plastic that are found on the hinge sections. Obviously, this needs to be done so that the hinge can fit together in a nice tight manner, as it would if you were assembling them appropriately. However, outside of spare track use, yeah, these things are pretty much abysmal. Moving topside takes to the rear engine deck, and this is basically where the majority of the detailing is going to be present on this build. Starting with the grill work, obviously this model has been upgraded with a set of photo etch grills that I may have mentioned before are from Edward. The Edward photo etch mesh sets are an excellent choice to add for your Panther project. Even though the sets are intended for use on the Tamiya Panther G. It is something that I've used on Dragon and also Italeri Panther Gs, and they work absolutely perfectly. They drop into the corresponding locations, and although it's not intended for use with this brand of Panther kit, it still does the job perfectly fine. The next thing that I want to mention are these two little brackets that you see here on either end of the rear engine deck. These on the real Panther are used to secure the tow cables in place on the rear portion of the vehicle. The Dragon Kit does not give you these provisions whatsoever. However, integrally molded onto the rear engine deck area are these two little rectangles where the brackets would be fitted in place. So on this bill here, instead of trying to just putty them up and blend them in, I simply just fabricated the brackets. They were fabricated out of a thin piece of aluminum from a soda can. I went ahead and cut that with a scissor, and bent it with a plier, and then they were secured in place with a drop of glue. It's a very simple piece to fabricate, and once added, it really does flesh out the rear area quite nicely. Also on the rear detailing here, I just want to mention the paintwork done on the rear antenna mount. We saw what this looked like earlier on in the video, before the model was painted, but now that the model is fully completed, you really get to appreciate the paintwork all that much more. So when it comes to painting the command versions of these German AFV antennas, there are some things to keep in mind. The first is with the insulator. The antenna base itself is sitting on top of this large upside down bowl looking like ceramic insulator and the insulator is made out of white porcelain. The detailing is present with the Dragon model and you do have to simply paint it in order to achieve the look. The unit was painted with flat white, and then a brush of Tamiya gloss was added in order to give that 
ceramic sheen that is present on not just this unit, but I've also touched upon on other German command vehicles that I've built in the past. The antenna base itself, of course, is made out of rubber, but the connector where the antenna actually makes contact with the insulator is made out of brass. In order to paint this, just a simple swipe of gold paint is how I always pull these off, and the exact same procedure was done to the antenna on the opposite side. On that note, you'll see that the vehicle does have two antenna wires present. As I mentioned, or may have touched upon before, the antenna stub that's that was integrally molded into the section over here was broken during the course of production. So I simply just amputated, drilled it out, and installed a little piece of floor wire. Floor wire was just painted black, as I often do, and the little connecting section, again, got a little swipe of gold paint. For the upside down umbrella mast, this was something that had to have been changed slightly from the kit original. The kit does supply you with the antenna molded in this section over here, and the top umbrella section is a separate piece that gets glued on. However, during the course of production, or I should say the final phases of production, and this seems to always happen on a large number of my builds, specifically ones with plastic antennas, which is why I hate plastic antennas, is that it was snagged and the piece just snapped off. And like I often mention, plastic antennas are just a magnet for getting snagged, and once they do, they are impossible to fix. So, was no harm done. Basically, I just snipped the the antenna remembrance left, drilled the section out with a pin vise, replaced it with a piece of floor wire, and then I just took the umbrella section and glued it to the top portion of the antenna. Problem solved. Now, in case the thing gets bent, it's easily fixed. I will say, though, I do have one other Dragon command vehicle with a setup like this, and that's my Dragon German Jagdpanzer that I built a little while ago. That one has the exact same detailing, and knock on wood, that one survived the gauntlet of the build, the photography, the filming, and it's currently housed in the collection in a nice little clear plastic box, impervious for the thing to be broken. So, so far, so good. That one seemed to have survived all of that. This one here, not, it was at the very tail end I snapped and I wasn't happy. But regardless, I was able to repair it in the condition that you see here. So if you are building one of these models or a model similar to this and you break the antenna, don't feel bad. It, it's something that can easily happen, but fortunately it's easily rectified. Also, as I often mention these videos on the Panther and King Tiger family of vehicles, this section here is actually the armor cover for the fuel cap. So in order to top off the fuel tanks, you take this large heavy plate off and then you have access to the filler cap underneath. Well, as I often do on my builds, I like to render these sections of having quite a bit of spillage present, which again is something I've personally seen and done on some pieces of heavy equipment. So having the model rendered in this format would definitely not be something that would be out of place. Moving to the front area, in comparison, there's really not a whole lot going on over here. The only thing that I do want to mention besides painting the periscope prisms, which is something that I always advocate on these model builds, is to paint the rubber bump stops found on the side opening Panther G style pattern of hatches. With the way this pattern vehicle is, there are these two rubber bump stops found in these two sections over here. They are integrally molded on. And with just a little swipe of paint, it's a simple way to, again, improve the accuracy of the build, as opposed to just leaving them oversprayed, which, again, a large number of people out there seem to do because they just don't realize about the material choice that these components are made in. And from there, this leads us to the turret. All of the stock details I touched upon before are present here, and you can see what they look like in their final form. The pieces paint very, very well, and once fully completed, the model does have some excellent detailing to the turret surface, as it does for really more or less the entire model. Starting with the optic, you'll notice that on this one here, I painted it black, and I also painted the optic itself with gloss black, which again is something that generally needs to be done on these patterns of vehicles. Over here, you can see the prisms that have been painted in the cupola, as well as also on the remainder of the turret itself. Again, something also to consider. And then this leads us to the MG42. The MG42 is very nicely detailed, and I just simply painted and weathered it in my usual forte. For the stock itself, I went with the unit being a red Bakelite material, which if anyone's a fan of my channel, you'll know that this is generally the de facto way I tend to paint the stocks on my turret mounted MGs, be it MG34s, 42s, or Brownings for that matter. And they always have a very nice appearance to them. While on the front portion over here, you get to see the two front optics. 
as I touched upon before, the kit's really cool in that it gives you several options to render these units, either fully exposed like I did over here to fully button up, or you can have one or the other one left in the open position. This obviously is best up to the taste and the discretion of the builder. While on the topic of the optics, one thing that I always mention in these videos is that I use the color gloss black in order to render these components. I have had questions in the comments section on past videos and I've also frequently get emails from people out there who see the videos and are curious why I use this color or what color do I use in case they missed it. Well, like I stated before, I use gloss black and this differs from some other people out there who build models. Uh, some individuals like to go with a blue color and some also use silver. In my opinion, silver is probably the worst color you can possibly use for the color of prisms as they're just not silver. In my opinion and from my experience of crawling all over these things from time to time and seeing them in person, I've always seen that the periscopes are always black, specifically when the vehicle's all buttoned up. As for the actual paint work, well, you have one of two ways to go about it. You can either just buy a bottle of gloss black over the counter, like say Tamiya Black, which their color black is gloss black, while their flat black is labeled such, and on that note, you could just go with flat black, but once that paint dries, you need to go over those sections again with a swipe of clear gloss lacquer. And honestly, that's how I've been doing it now for about a year and a half. I ran out of gloss black a little while ago, and I've been going with the other format ever since, just purely out of pragmatism. But regardless, either way will get you the same result. At the very front of the vehicle, we have the dummy barrel, and as I touched upon before, it is a two-piece assembly, which is customary on basically all plastic tank model kits. And just like on those other builds, I took care of the seams in the exact same manner with some super glue and some sandpaper. Well, once it's fully completed, you get to see the results that are present on this model. Once everything is thoroughly blended in, it leaves for a very nice appearance once complete. Also, because on the real vehicle this would have been a dummy, on this one here I did not add a little bit of powder filing, which is normally airbrush onto the end section, for a reason that should be, well, fairly obvious. The last thing I want to mention before I go to the paint is with the optic. Obviously it's in the exposed state, but as I mentioned before, the unit is fully removable and can be stowed inside the vehicle with that cool magnet trick. And for the duration of this entire video, I've basically left it in the open state just because again of the vehicle subject matter. But as you can clearly see, the unit, now that's fully painted, still works exactly the way I intended it when I first incorporated this cool little feature on this model. And like I stated before, it's the best way to have your cake and eat it too. One last thing I want to mention about the Commander's Cupola before I button it up is that on the inside portion over here I went ahead and painted the headrest detail which is integrally molded into the model. Normally this is not something I really give all that much attention to because generally the model is built all buttoned up and the hatches are glued shut. However, because this one does have the functional hatch feature, I went ahead and painted the inner detailing as you see present. Obviously, as I mentioned my 1.6 scale content, the headrest here is there to just give a little bit of extra padding to give the tank commander just a little bit of extra protection and to prevent him from bumping his noggin giving him a pretty good headache. The model all buttoned up, this leads us to the paint and the markings. For the model's paint work, on this model here I wanted to do something very different compared to my usual German tank or the other Panther builds that I've mentioned in the past. Generally when I do a German tank it's a three-tone camouflage pattern specifically for a German tank of this you know mid to late war era. Well I usually have my same go-to colors, but for this one here, I wanted to do something different. I wanted to stretch outside my comfort zone and do something a bit different and unique. First is with the base coat. Generally on my German tanks, I go with a Dunkelgelb color. However, I have played around with a green dominant color scheme, and oddly enough, both of those were on Panther base vehicles. One was a Panther FF, and the other one was a Jagd Panther. However, for this one here, the color green is very different compared to those other two options. This one here, I was inspired by a picture of a Hetzer that I seen on the internet at a model show, and the individual just crushed it. That model looked absolutely gorgeous, and so much so that I basically was heavily inspired to make my pattern here very similar to what he did. Now, what's unique is the color green. Rather than the standard Dunkelgrün that I generally use on my builds, this one, the green is more or less a olive drab 
type color. And this is something that I have seen on very late war German tanks, along with some of the other colors that I'll touch upon in a second. So I went ahead, I cobbled together a shade or a swatch of green that closely emulated the one on the vehicle that I was using as a inspiration. I went to the Home Depot, had it mixed into a quart format, and then I went ahead, came home and painted the model. The model was airbrushed in the same manner that I've touched upon in the other videos that I showed the painting techniques, and it was actually looking very, very gorgeous. And it occurred to me that, holy crap, it's because it's a different shade of olive drab, and of course I'm an olive drab guy, and, and everything looks good in olive drab, even a Prius. Okay, well maybe not a Prius, everything else will look great in olive drab, and the, the vehicle was looking very pretty. However, once the olive drab color was set, and by the way, this shade I have used already on a few other American builds that are on the that have been completed and are waiting to be filmed, and I'll touch upon that later. It's a bit different of an olive drab shade compared to my other usual content, but more info about that later. Regardless, the olive color was applied, and then for the camouflage, I went with my shade of Dunkelgelb, which I've used on many, many German tanks found on this channel, but the Dunkel Braun is not my usual shade. Rather than that color, I went with this more of a, I guess, a dark red primer type coloring. And again, I have seen several real wartime color photographs of German vehicles in the color configuration that you see here. And the color of the brown mimics that very closely. As for the color brown, this is Tamiya Hull Red. Just straight up, no other colors added to it. I just took Tamiya Hull Red, thoroughly mixed it, and applied it on the model. One other thing I want to mention is with the application of the camouflage itself. Normally on my build, specifically my German World War II builds, the camouflage is always applied via an airbrush. However, for this one, again, I wanted to step outside my comfort zone and I wanted to make a real crisp cut camo job. And so to do that, the camouflage pattern entirely on this build is done via a paintbrush. This is something that I don't really do very often. In fact, I often mention in my videos that if you're building a German tank, you're gonna need an airbrush because generally the camouflage patterns were airbrush or spray gun or and or airbrush applied. And that is true. However, there are some certain circumstances where you can go with a paintbrush on a German camo pattern. This is one of them. And the trick with applying a camouflage pattern with a paintbrush does require some skill sets. It's not like, oh, it's easier than an airbrush. It just requires a different type of skills. Fortunately, over the last few years, I've been playing around with applying camouflage patterns on my models, both in 172 and 135, with a paintbrush, and I went ahead and basically perfected it to the point that you see on this build here. The trick when you're applying a paintbrush camo job is consistency and dilution of the paint. Paintbrushes will show the effects of the strokes, and if the paint is not thoroughly diluted, it will slaughter you on your build. You have to have the paint watered down to just the right amount. Too runny, and obviously it's gonna run a mess. Too thick, and you're gonna get strokes. So that whole meme of thin your paints, yeah, it is definitely, I can't stress it enough, super true for a paintbrush camo job. However, once the paint job is applied and it's applied properly, it will give you a certain look that you just can't get with an airbrush. There are people out there that do this type of look with an airbrush, but the reason why they're able to do that because they use masks of one sort or another, which is a great technique. It's not one that I personally like, but you get the same technique, or I should say the same outcome with that type of a method. Me personally, I would rather just go with a paintbrush as opposed to trying to do the mask with clay or Play-Doh or tape or whatever they, they use. For me, this method is definitely easier for, for my taste. Anyway, so the camo pattern was applied and as you can see, it is as flat as as flat can be. No strokes, no runs, nothing. It is basically one of the flattest paint jobs I've ever done. And I personally think it came out really, really unique. It's really cool and it looks very different, most importantly, to the other kits, or I should say the other models that I've built in my collection. For the weathering, this is where I switched back to the airbrush and I went ahead and applied filters and some washes to it 
in the same manner that I've touched upon in the other videos. Counter shading was also utilized, again, all done with the airbrush. For the chipping itself, that's done with the dry brush method. Again, all of these techniques I showcase frequently in the OTR videos. And if anyone's curious on how exactly I go about painting a model and weathering it to the condition you see here, I recommend checking out those videos that are found on the ECA channel. Outside of the weathering, it was then time to apply the markings. And the markings on this model are the Kit Supply Water Slide decals, and they're great. They were excellent quality, which is something that I've seen on many other Dragon builds of the 1990s era, and even mostly that's still true today. These Dragon kits have excellent quality water slide decals. They go on without any problems. And most importantly, the entire model was thoroughly coated with the VMS matte varnish, which not only has a great effect with just amplifying the vibrance of the colors on the model itself, but it is probably still, in my opinion, the best product I've seen out there for sealing the decals to the model, again, in a flat manner where they don't even look like they're decals. It's a excellent product. I cannot recommend it enough. And at the end of the day, I couldn't be any happier in how this build turned out. This was one of those model kits that I always wanted when I used to see them when I was younger in catalogs and magazines and also occasionally in hobby shops or a model show or two. But because of the individual Lincoln Link track, it always kept me away from acquiring one of these models in order to add it to my collection. Well, now that I finally been able to acquire the model and build it up correcting many of those shortcomings that I touched upon before, this is definitely going to be a nice welcome addition to the collection. And I suppose this is a perfect point to pivot into skill level and recommendation. The old school artillery spotting panther kit here from Dragon is a very nice build in its own right. It goes together fairly easily. There's not really all that many surprises or that much hand fitting that needs to be done in order to just build it with the out of the box configuration. And then there's the asterisk and that of course is with the tracks. Obviously, the stock kit does supply you with individual Lincoln Link tracks. These tracks are always garbage on a good day and generally are always something that need to be replaced with an aftermarket source. If you really want to build this model to its maximum potential, the original tracks need to go and if you replace it with any sort of an aftermarket track or any single piece track of your choosing, it will greatly improve the model compared to the original kit configuration. So who would I actually recommend this kit to? I do have a lot of beginners that watch this channel, which by the way, thank you for that. And it's nice to know that my opinions and my videos are being taken uh, you know, seriously and people are considering them during their purchases. Well, if you are a beginner, I cannot recommend this kit. Not necessarily because of the tracks, although that is something to keep in mind, specifically if you are a beginner and you generally are budget conscious, but with just the kit itself, outside the tracks, this model is relatively a simple build. However, I'm not comfortable with recommend it to a beginner because of some of the finely detailed molded bits that are found on the engine deck, as well as many of the other details that are present on the model surface. This is something that is really more or less intended for someone that's already built about a dozen or possibly half a dozen builds or so, and chances are by that point there, you're really no more in the beginner phase, and I guess you're basically in the intermediate type realm. Obviously, a huge, huge thing to have ironed down when you're doing a build like this is going to be the paintwork. German tanks always require a little bit more skill sets compared to American and Russian tanks, specifically in terms of the paint. Unlike those other vehicles where you just get a can of Krylon olive green or forest green or what have you and paint the model in that format, German tanks are not really meant for that. They are really best left painted with someone who has an airbrush, which is kind of ironic for this particular build because I paint brushed it, but I already talked about that earlier. And regardless, even though you are going to be applying a camouflage scheme of one sort or another, generally this means you are going to need to have a more advanced level of skill sets in order to better apply the type of paintwork that you're going to need for a build like this. And this is why these builds here, by and large, are really more or less meant for someone who's an intermediate to an advanced range. Someone who's an immediate builder already has the fundamentals down, they have their tools for actually just building the model, let alone for 
painting them and, and weathering them. Those should basically be figured out by this point. And this build here is a great level up compared to some of the other more simplistic kits that are on the market. Like I mentioned before, the kit is mostly a simple put together build. They go together very well, but as for a out of the gate, I never touched a plastic model kit before type builder, the answer is gonna be no. Aside from the intermediate builder, a advanced builder can easily tackle one of these projects without any problems at all. And I'm just gonna circle back to what I mentioned before about the budget minded. There are a lot of people right now, specifically in this economy, where they wanna buy and build a nice plastic model kit for their collection, but they are working with a somewhat limited budget. If that's you, these kits here and kits like this perhaps should be something that you might want to steer past at this point in time. Because of the individual Lincoln Lake nature, obviously they need to go, they need to be replaced in order for you just to have an enjoyable build and have something that looks somewhat decent. And in order to do that, you are going to have to swap out the tracks with some kind of an aftermarket solution. Fortunately, there are lots of aftermarket tracks out there specifically for Panthers that are on the market. And they range from different materials, as I was mentioning earlier. However, this also ties into costs. Sometimes the replacement tracks will cost the same, if not more, than the base starter kit itself. And if you're an advanced range builder or an intermediate builder and you are going into the project knowing this and you have the budget set aside, rock on. But if you're looking for a build where you are only going to use what the box gives you, no more, no less, then perhaps you wanna pump your brakes and look elsewhere for another type of kit. With the tracks in mind, you are going to be spending more on this build depending on what you're going to be acquiring. They could be single piece vinyl here, which I paid about 12 or 15 bucks for, or you could even go much more expensive with a set of Frulies, which costs about 40. Regardless, these are some things to really consider when you're picking up a model like this. Something else to keep in mind is that these models are fairly prolific and you may encounter one for a bargain bin price. And if that happens, you know, perhaps then that might loosen up the, the purse string, so to speak, in order to have a little bit more of a budget for aftermarket components. But this is, again, is something best left up to discretion of the builder. As for the more advanced skill set minded individual, obviously if they want to improve upon this kit further, there is no shortage of aftermarket parts and components out there for Panther base models in order to take this thing well past what the model gives you and even what I did over here with some basic sets of photo etch. Panthers have components in just about any medium under the sun from photo etch, cast resin, cast metal, turned aluminum, 3D print, you name it, there's probably about four or five different options for one component found on these vehicles that you can possibly find. So souping one of these up and taking it further from the configuration that I have over here is definitely something that can be done relatively easily. As for cost, well again, that goes back to what I said before about the budget, and that really more or less depends on the discretion of the builder. And that's more or less all there is to mention about skill level, and this drags us directly into recommendations. Obviously, this being the subject matter that it is, I cannot recommend this vehicle enough for anyone who's an avid fan of the German Zoo. If you like building examples of the elephant, the lion, the tiger, the bear, oh my, this kit here would fit into that collection without any sort of problems. I would also recommend this model to anyone who's just a fan of the panther and all the different variants of the panther, which there are many of. Now, this is where things can get a little murky because although there are some people out there that are just avid Panther fans, there are some other people that tend to take that to the next extreme. There are lots of fans out there of this pattern of vehicle, and there are some fans that are just mind-blowingly nuts with the Panther, where they can tell you every single production unit who made it, they could tell you every single small nuance on what day of the week it was built on. And I wouldn't be surprised if they could tell you who was actually working on the production line at that time, screwing in a bolt. And the reason why this kit here might not necessarily be recommended for that type of person is because those people tend to be a little overkill with the 
type of accuracy that they want on their model. This being an older Dragon kit from the 90s may have some surface details on it that may not particularly be accurate for that type of person's needs. But regardless, if you're that type of an individual, perhaps you might want to stick with something with newer tooling, either the newer tooling artillery observation vehicle from Dragon that came out a number of years later, or possibly stick with some of the more super kits out there on the market from Meng and TACOM. And although I don't believe they've done this variant of the Panther yet, perhaps if you're one of those type of people, you might want to just wait for something like that to come out. Something else to consider is that this vehicle here is technically a paper panzer, which means a lot of those rules that you live by may be bent a little bit because there is some artistic licensing to be had since this vehicle here never entered into production or is really known to have ever existed. And because of that, that kind of opens up and loosens the restrictions quite a bit in my opinion. And on a similar note, if you're a fan of the German World War II paper panzers, obviously, need I say any more. Because of the vehicle subject matter, I think it would actually be an excellent contender for the use in a diorama type setting. You could probably have some interesting settings depicted with this working with a Hummel or Wesp of some flavor or another. And perhaps this might be something to consider if you're looking for just something a little bit interesting to add to a diorama scene. Finally, I would also recommend this kit for anyone who's just an avid collector of dragon model kits or vintage dragon and tank model kits in general. Like I mentioned before, this kit here is a vintage release from the 1990s period. And because of that, there are some individuals out there, yours truly included, that just like to build and collect model kits from that era and, you know, have them displayed in their collection. Regardless, my collection is definitely a little bit better now because I have this particular model added to it. And I'm pretty sure so will yours. One last thing to consider is the availability and the cost. As far as I know, these kits have not been in production for a number of years, but a good number of them were produced during their run. And with Dragon having some excellent distribution services, and they do frequently re-release older tooling kits, it may be possible to track one of these down for not a whole lot of money. These kits are a little bit different compared to some of the other models that I've reviewed in the past where they've crossed over into the collector market and the price has just exploded on them. These ones here are still relatively available and can be found for prices that are quite a bit less considering an arm and a leg. And if you are in a hobby shop type setting or a model show or an eBay auction or whatever venue that you're in and you see one and you get to acquire one for a price that's under $40 or so, maybe it's definitely something that you can add to your collection, specifically if you have the skill sets and consider the other factors that I mentioned before. As I touched upon earlier, they do make a very interesting and unique addition to your collection and it would definitely be worth checking out if it's something that may tick some boxes for you. And with that, that wraps up this model showcase video for this 135th scale German, and I will say the name one final time in Alf Deutsch, Panzer Beobt Achtungswagen Alf Gay Panther. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to this channel where it's a great way to keep up to date on new posted content, being model showcase videos like this one over here, or the other larger scale project update videos that frequently get posted to this channel. Another way to keep in loop and new posts content is by liking us on Facebook, where I have more photographs of this particular build, as well as the other smaller and larger scale builds that have been seen on this channel previously. Furthermore, don't forget to swing by EastCoastArmory.com for more 1.6 and 1.16 scale builds and detail components. Thanks again, I'll be seeing you all again on the next one. Till then.